although we think that this issue is very important, but yes, for for Jokowi himself, I guess he doesn't think that yes, it is as important as we think. And I'm talking about the 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 uh, Jokowi and anti-corruption campaign in Indonesia. So I want to call it the, the first five months of the Jokowi administration that. Uh, I think all of you know about the, the recent uh, uh, conflict between uh, KPK and the, 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 the police uh, after the nomination of the Budi Gunawan as the chief of the police. And uh, this is these are the picture of the yeah, demonstration. And there are still a series of demonstrations <coughs> in Indonesia uh, against the beginning of KPK and also for the law enforcement again against the, the, the police corruption. So, but let me start with the achievement of uh, Jokowi uh, in terms of good governance, in terms of anti-corruption. There are some some issues that some policy that he has been uh, uh, implemented. The first thing that uh, also we have to acknowledge is the implementation of uh, national one-stop service for business license and, and permit. Uh, actually, this is a common policy for the local government, but it's not a national uh, policy. But under Jokowi, uh, he, he pressed all the administration to be centralized under the, the PKPM. What is the name of this PKPM? Like a National Coordination for Investment Board. Board, uh, investment yeah. board in Indonesia. And I predict that in the near future, they will be reducing in terms of, uh, you know, uh, License, cost, and also the extortion in the, in the license. And secondly, the the uh, he put a lot of attention in the transportation, so that's why his uh, top policies like building uh, sea tall, I mean connecting all the the island in Indonesia, building infrastructure, uh, ports, and to to reduce the, the the ultimate goal is to reduce the transportation cost. Logistic, and then the another good uh, uh, policy is the broadening access of public services, particularly the health services. And Indonesia finally has a, a national insurance health insurance scheme. Although it has been uh, uh, you know, uh, prepared by under the SBY administration through BPJS, but the Jokowi actually that they implement that that, that scheme and. Uh, Education, they also put attention on, 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 on education, but they don't know yet the, the, what the, 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 the particular policy, but at least uh, the abolition of the national examination, you know, I'm a father of a doctor, I'm very happy to hear that policy. You know, national examination in Indonesia uh, put stress not only for the student, but also for the parents, because they have to prepare for the student uh, in order to pass the examination if the student fail the examination it be uh, terrible and also the the, the first uh, 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 good policy is involving KPK what I'm saying is in commission and PPATK is a anti laundering authority in the selection of cabinet ministry so for me at the time it was so so you know um, you know I don't believe anything wrong to come in for KPK to check the, the, the whether the Candidate of minister in both corruption cases, or or they have suspicious account uh, in the bank uh, by uh, requesting information from the PPATK. Uh, so it was a, a good policy. But uh, then uh, there are also weaknesses, particularly you know, or you know about the nomination of Budi Gunawan as chief of Indonesian police, and, and Jokowi is unable to resolve the conflict between KPK and, 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 and police and stop the criminalization of capital leaders. And uh, uh, last week, we had uh, here a discussion uh, presented by the Marcus Misner. You know, last year, uh, Indonesian update, we have uh, annual organized Indonesian update, and the uh, topic last year was uh, SQI legacy. And according to last week presentation of Marcus Misner, he has to revise all of this you know, articles, all of this uh, uh, common art on SQL legacy regarding the, after we know the case of, you know, even Jokowi is worse than, than, than SQL. 
in terms of uh, resolving uh, uh, conflict between the KPK and, 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 and the police. And, uh, and last year, there was also the discussion about SPY personality. And then uh, last week, the discussion is changing with the personality. I think it's not personality anymore, but how the institutional setting you know, constrain the, the leader to take a, a, a decision. Because, uh, you know, the, 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 the political coalition and then the pressure from the coalition uh, restrain the, the, the leader to, to, to take uh, any decisive, uh, decisive uh, uh, policy. And I guess this, this paper, the book that will be launched based on last year's update, will be much different with the initial version. And I quote the, 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 the Jokowi uh, official program. It's very clear. Uh, you will, they will support the Corruption Education Commission. And then the, they said the, the below is uh, the Jokowi will select, uh, will select clean, original, and chief of police. It's written in this official policy. But I quote from from, from investigate on the reporting, which is the, the, the money transfer to the Kuti Kunawan uh, account and then the transfer to other account. So the case is it's just it's very clear this is a, a, a money laundering case. Or she received from the the books Firman General Firman Gami or the, the chief of local police. Uh, and then the uh Sajan Sitapu, this is the and lecture national policy to chief school, but also traffic director in the North Sumatra police. So we know that the traffic police is also uh, a casco of the police institution, a source of, a source of the money. At the time, Kuti Gunawan is uh, like a human resource, uh, head of human resource within the police, so that's why he can collect the money from the, the police that want to be appointed for the higher rank. So uh, that's why you collect the money, and then uh, the one is, uh, you know, it's very, very... In Indonesia, we talk about M, million, or billion, yeah, the, 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 the money. And he transferred the money, he had the money through under the, the account of his son, and he had the Atama, and, and his staff uh, in the Arab. So that's why he had the, the, the money. <coughs> so I talk in Indonesia, I speak, uh, I talk to friends in Indonesia. If you want to be a businessman, do not go to the business school. Or even a new school, a new business school. You know, it's not comparable with uh, what the achievement of the Kuti So the best business school in Indonesia is the police institution. <laughs> if you want to do it, you go to the police academy. And it's according to police uh, uh, investigation, it's clear. No, no, no illegal activity. Because it is all in business. So before the, 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 the KPK take over the case, actually the case has been investigated by the police and they said that there is no, no illegal activity regarding this, this uh, <coughs> transfer of the money. This case uh, uh, for me is very, very personal because I did the investigative reporting in 2010 with the police, with, with the uh, Tempo, and one of my staff was, was uh, head, they said, mm -hmm. yes, yes. almost, almost near the time in 2010, <coughs> after we, 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 we revealed the, the, the Kuti Kunawan case. And, and, and finally, case uh, 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 pulled up by the, the, the KPK, and the KPK uh, uh, named him as the suspect before, after Jokowi nominated him as the chief of the police. But I don't know, maybe now the case will be, because KPK lost in the pre-trial court, uh, uh, but it, and and the case should be transferred to the to the attorney general and in the beginning the attorney general says that this case will be transferred again to the police. So they say we will come back to the initial investigation with the police. The police said there is no illegal activity regarding the transfer of the money. We break his promise, so there are a lot of criticism, particularly from the uh, middle class, uh, one of the supporters of the middle class. Uh, this is the early demonstration against Sokowi uh, at, at the KPK when he was uh, nominated to the Bunawa. So, uh, the content, what's the content of Sokowi? Because officially, 
uh, all of us know, and, and, and even I did campaign, you know, the Jokowi is a good uh, leader, you know, he, he, he has a, a, a good track record as supporting anti-corruption uh, reform when he was, uh, when he was uh, mayor of Solo and also mayor of Jakarta. But why he, 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 he can't do the, the, the reform? Because the first, he cannot effectively manage his political uh, uh, support. And, and probably, uh, he did not, we, all of us did not uh, 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 you know, realize that the biggest of his now is the PTIP, not the, 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 uh, uh, the, the coalition led by the, the uh, 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 KMP coalition in Putin. And, and yeah, Jokowi is not concerned actually. He lack of the macro <coughs> or, or problem, like you know, uh, law issue, international relations. Uh, he focus on infrastructure, health services, education. You know, so that's why some friends told me that yes, he's just he likes his level is just mayor or it's just dirjen, you know, uh, not not the, the top level of, of, of the state. And also we have to. To reconsider again how the the, the the resilience of corruption because even president you know could not eradicate corruption in the last that has been embedded in the government institution you know like the case of Budi Gunawan is clearly uh, reflects how the corruption within the policy someone want to be appointed by a rank yeah, to give some amount of money and the, the, the structure embedded in the in the, in the formal uh, regulation within the, the policy institution. And, and last that, yes, corruption can be educated through perfect sector reform and narrow minded good governance. So that's why corruption and radicalism corruption is just fighting against political economy of powerful interest. And Choco is not magic, you know, medicine that can cover all the problems, including corruption, like we thought before. I thought before that, yes, I have Choco in then my job as the profit job, as the anti-corruption uh, campaigner will be much, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's not, it's, you know, it will be easy because Jokowi will be, will take his good but now I have to reconsider that, 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 that uh, you know, my, 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 my comment. So, uh, the last that KPK cannot fight, cannot fight against all of our interests and uh, you know, we, I talked to the KPK that, Yes, we have to realize that KPK will not fight against all the people at the same time. They have to targeting one area and then you know let the other area handled by the other institution. If KPK want to focus on law enforcement agency, I guess KPK should avoid the, the political corruption because you know KPK could not fight all the the, 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 the corrupter in the in the same time. And then civil society should expand the social movement beyond with the past movement and will become coalition because all the demonstration actually still in the in the, in the in the in the middle class and it is not connected with the it's not easy to connect the corruption issue with the daily life of uh, the problem of daily life uh, uh, people in the public services and thank you for your kind attention speakers who imported from Sydney and, uh, and, and I think it is a very very good idea I think to have a shared feeling even we are in Indonesia we have to speak in English you can see the environment only some of you is really from Portugal. but anyway this is actually very interesting topic and uh, as you know the human rights issues is a part of Jokowi campaign during the presidential elections. And I should add to myself that I also endorse and support Jokowi <coughs> during the elections. But anyway, in the first, I mean, the, I, this is actually five months of Jokowi administrations. The problem, I spent three months in Indonesia. I just go back two weeks ago from Jakarta. Also with uh, some, you know, I already gave a green, uh, yellow card by my supervisor because I'm just doing nothing in Jakarta. 
rather than you know involving myself in a human rights campaign and forget my about my thesis. But anyway, I will dissolve it tomorrow. <laughs> so let's begin with let's begin let's begin with the, actually this I took also from the, the program by Joko. Uh, as you can see, this is actually the yeah, human rights program uh, about education, human rights education. It's about the past human rights abuse. It's about also revisions on military justice law, and also about the issues of this, uh, you know, against discrimination. But on November 2014, uh, we human rights defender we got hit with one decisions on the case when Polycarpus got, their, uh, got his parole. And this actually hit us. And we are studying questionings about this policy on Chocro, on, on parole. As we know that, uh, I'm also involved on this issue since I still work uh, at Impartial, one of the prominent human rights NGO in Indonesia, which is Munir is my, my boss, and also my brother, and also my close friends. But this actually shows how the lack of commitment to competition of violation of human rights cases. And this actually in the beginning of his administrations. And we always said that in our campaigns on protection on human rights defender that you know a person like Munir, Munir is a first class human rights defender, which murdered by the national intelligence. And I cannot imagine, like me, or other human, local human rights defenders, you know, about their faith, their protections. Mm. So we had, this actually had a bad precedent and impact to our job as human rights defenders. I believe that you all understand human rights defenders. You actually part of our human rights defenders. You know, human rights defenders, the minimum definition is a person who defines you know, your rights or other rights, as long as you took the, the peaceful way and took in the principle of universal of human rights. So the case of Munir is one of the first uh, problem in the issues of human rights, especially on recognitions and protection of human rights. Second one, this is actually a good one. Uh, since I just came to Jakarta at 8 December, I celebrate my birthday on Human Rights Day. I was born on the same day. Uh, and uh, as you, you can see these two news, which is, it's, which is very different, different things. On 9 December 2014, Jokowi met with held them, not held them, yes, held them in Jakarta with uh, supporting by uh, witness and victims uh, what is it? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, so they held a meeting and Jokowi came to open the meeting and in the same day he said that uh, his administration will resolve the cases of past human rights abuse. So, as we can see that there are two ways he agreed that ad hoc tribunal, human rights ad tribunal, and truth and reconciliation commissions, where right now the bills is will be discussed, will be debated on the parliaments on these sessions, on these year's sessions. But the ne very next day, Vice President Yusuf Kala had another thought about reconciliations about you know human past human rights abuse so he said about the government will not you know say forgive or show their forgiveness on past human rights abuse he even took the case on the assassinations of president kennedy which is very very ridiculous he said that used to look even america never solved this problem which is already more than 50 years, but this is this is actually a very very ridicule arguments regarding how we should embrace human rights issues and how <coughs> we should resolve our past human rights abuse because this is actually deal with our future. If we cannot uh, resolve past human rights abuse, it means that we cannot resolve as a you know, as a nations. 
who is will be respect human rights. Next one, I think this is very hot in America and also I actually in, involved in these issues for the last three months. Death penalty, ladies and gentlemen. So in the first batch of execution, I remember that we trying to approach the palace because the first batch uh, of the execution we have uh, six people. But we failed because Joko at the time, during the same session of on December 9, 2014, said that I'm not going to give any clemency for drug dealers. So this is his policy. He stand firm of his policy regarding no negotiation on drug issues. But for the last three months, when it comes to the second batch of the executions, the civil society actually realized we have actually the old, the oldest coalitions, which is established in 1970s, is Hati, Hapuskan Hukuman Mati, established in early 1970s by our senior human rights defender like Todung Mulya Lubis, Adnan Buyum Nasution, and others. So I actually the coordinator ones. And my, my organization actually is become headquarters. So we are also, you know, took these issues very seriously after this first uh, executions. But the problem, uh, especially, we have a problem with Australian government. I should say, frankly, that your government not help your subject you actually make us have a backfire to our public because we talk actually about the we actually very active on human rights campaign abolishing of death penalty we never differentiate between people who has color or have a green yellow white we never care about that as long as a human and we embrace that because we believe right to life is the only is one of the mightiest uh, human rights uh, when they so-called non eligible rights. <clears throat> but since your government said about tsunami aid, that's when everything. We actually talked with the presidential advisor and also some of president trustee uh, people, which is, he actually trying to delay the execution and trying to consider the execution. Especially for Brazilian, one Brazilian actually had uh, got uh, schizophrenia. So he has, he's trying to exchange or commit uh, the sentence. But the problem when first about tsunami aid by Tony Abbott and the rejection by President Dilma Rousseff of Indonesia ambassador in in uh, presidential palace, that make everything change. Even the last. The last uh, statement regarding exchange of prisoner, it is just make Indonesia in make Indonesia feeling that feeling insult, because we never engage war with you Australia. Why exchange prisoner? That's the first. The second one, can you imagine two Australian exchange with three Indonesians? That's equal. That's actually people from uh, from palace actually arguing uh, to us. So that's the feeling of Indonesians and. The problem of the death penalty is also become a backlash for, especially for Indonesia, because we have almost 200 people, you know, same under threat of a, a death penalty, and also threaten our Indonesian international relations. We knew that uh, some of uh, like British subjects and France subject also is in death row, on death row. But the minister of minister of foreign affairs from UK. He succeeded actually approach the, the government and give some concession again helping to fighting the drug dealers. And also uh, French government, they actually the government has summoned our ambassador in Paris and they are trying to use the European uh, Union to <coughs> to you know trying to push us. <coughs> this actually <coughs> actually uh, endanger our position, Indonesian positions. However, I mean that in dealing with our countries' relations, Indonesia, Australia, I think Australia is one of the countries who has a problem in dealing with our advocacy in these issues. Because I remember when we, when SBY gave clemency to Scapel Corbyn, 
the Australian, Australian government never mentions about uh, the civil society effort on abolishing that penalty. And the second one, public even, you know, I'm sorry to say that public even, uh, how do you get? Uh, I'm trying to soften my, my mm. trying to choose the word, but since couple called me that, I fool you, Indonesia, so they never forget about that. <coughs> so this actually become a public concern that the president should give uh, execution immediately, especially this guys from Bali. And relations with, uh, you know, Indonesia still remember how Kevin Rudd said, justice has been done when Indonesia executed Bali Pombi. And now where are you when Bali 9, and you said that about human rights is here? Where are you on Bali Pombi? Why are you silence? <coughs> sometimes silence is not golden. Sometimes silence is between. <coughs> now, in dealing with human rights, it is not uh, good when we are not touching about the military reform. This is actually part of my thesis issues and also part of my job in Imparsia. When we're dealing with the military reform of human rights, of human rights there are seven components. This is from Nicole Wall, Bota, and Van der And these seven, actually, the number one and number seven is very important. And number five is also the main of the, the relation between civil and military. So what exactly happened with the military justice reform, which is adopted as a part of the Jokowi's program? Failure to put this revisions, law number 37, 1991, 1997 concerning military justice law in our uh, national legislation, legislation program, 2015-2019. So this is actually the old story since 2004, the struggle between civilian and military justice jurisdictions, and also it's end up with impunity issues. This is actually another bill, which is, we also already criticized. Actually, a week ago, Impartial gave a press release regarding bill on secrecy and bill of national security. Why? Because a special bill of the national security, we believe that this bill will threaten the, again, have an impact on human rights. Because uh, the military trying to involve the local politics, and this is actually the way they involve again in our national politics. I think. This is actually our my presentations. I don't I don't have recommendations, but the, but I believe with this government, I believe Jokowi and his administration still have a, you know still have accept critics, still heard what what we say. That is why when in the issues of KPK, for example, when we <coughs> actually uh, support the team line, team Zambilan, so when, so when Buya has uh, played his role on these issues of KPK on the back end versus the police, so Jokowi considered not to inaugurate or uh, yeah, inaugurate the inaugurate Budi Gunawan. So we believe on uh, we still believe I personally believe on this in this administration. However, we still we still have a you know we has, we have to monitor and also give more critics especially in the issues of human rights, because this is actually the backbone of, of these administrations. Thank you very much, Dejan. Revolution in the streets, the street revolution. If you're referring to something four years earlier, 
saying it's too early to say its implications. So I think here today, five months into uh, five years administration, it is too early to say uh, about the Jokowi administration. But we have heard from Danang and from Bakara that some of the early signs in terms of human rights and corruption and upholding human rights and fighting against corruption aren't good. And I'd have to agree with that, unfortunately. But we hope that as the administration goes on, uh, that they will gain confidence and strength and fight against the forces that are stopping um, uh, the fight against corruption and to uphold human rights. As it happens today in Jakarta, the KPK is uh, signing an agreement along with 29 ministries and state institutions, as well as 21 provincial administrations to fight corruption in the natural resource sector. The president is there and will also sign this agreement. So there are activities going on. There is a general criticism of uh, the document being signed today that it's focus, not that it's focuses on natural resources, I think that's appreciated, but that there's a realignment of Kapika towards um, uh, stopping corruption rather than eradicating it and looking at uh, create changing institutional practices so that it's harder for corruption to emerge. Uh, my opinion on this is that in fact both efforts are needed. We really need corruption cases, corrupt officials taken to court, but we also need the effort to see how can we create administrative structures that make it harder for corruption to take place. That's also very important. And one of the ANU scholars, uh, Marcus Mitzen, has written on this and has said, in fact, Indonesia also needs to uh, reform its regulation on the funding of uh, political parties. Because one of the root causes of corruption in Indonesia for elected officials is their need to generate funds for their election campaigns and for their political parties. And unless they, some of that funding can come from the basic uh, approach of where where a party uh, obtains votes, uh, it can be rewarded through funding from government, so it can have a secure budget to go forward. Unless that's the case, then political parties in Indonesia will rely on oligarchs or corruption. So another route there that needs delving into, and we would hope that uh, the current administration can take on. <clears throat> My work concerns uh, human rights in the context of natural resource management. I work for a human rights organization called Forest Peoples Program. And so my work uh, involves looking at what's happening in the licensing process in the oil palm sector, the pulp and paper sector, and giving support to community groups uh, and communities directly involved in struggles to have their rights recognized. Um, that is a clear commitment from the current administration. Uh, and we're yet to see how far Jokowi and his ministries will take this, but they continue to maintain that addressing and supporting uh, indigenous people's rights, creating mechanisms for resolving conflicts between communities and uh, license holders uh, are important steps. I think another big change they've made, and we've seen the consolidation of the Ministry of Environment and the Ministry of Forestry, but the plan is that that super ministry will not be involved in issuing licenses and that licensing uh, will become uh, an activity at the cabinet level involving the investment and coordination coordinating board, the BKPM. Now if that happens, and it's some steps away, it's a lot of work, but that would free up the forestry and environment ministry to be involved in, uh, in uh, monitoring and regulating license holders and it would take away corruption from that level. Of course, you still may well have corruption at the higher level, but it would allow the Ministry of Environment and Forestry to get on with its work to make sure uh, that forests um, and environment values are being maintained and that license holders aren't involved in damaging or destroying them. So I think that's an important policy commitment, but again, it's too early to say there are too many steps needed before uh, that can take place. What we do have is commitment from the government that the moratorium on licenses at present in the forestry sector and in fisheries 
uh, will continue. And that allows the ministries to focus on uh, monitoring, evaluating, and uh, regulating the industry rather than being involved in that treadmill, production mill, and drug activities associated with licensing. Another commitment from uh, Djokovic's administration is that um, uh, although the RDD agency and the National Climate Council have been subsumed and taken into the Environment and Forestry Ministry, that the commitments that have been made by those bodies to international partners will be continued, and that the One Map initiative to bring all government uh, licenses and mapping processes into one data set will continue, and that that's a key effort to fight corruption. It's also a key way for community rights to be brought into the, the same maps and data sets that the different administrations have. And there is a commitment from the government that where uh, community maps have been developed, that they can be brought into that same mapping process. In November, just a month into his job, Jokowi went up to Riau and was shown around by NGOs and community support groups looking at uh, what was happening in the peat swamps. He met with community groups and he saw the devastation, he saw the smoke and fires, and made very strong statements then in November saying companies who are involved in destroying our peat lands uh, will be prosecuted and they'll lose their licenses, and that community rights over the natural resources must be respected. He also said that the, uh, the pre presidential decree on people <coughs> that had been issued by the previous president, by SVA, would be fully implemented. Shortly after that, there was a strong response from the plantation industry, the oil palm and oil paper companies, saying this was impossible and that they would suffer uh, enormous economic losses if they weren't allowed to develop peat. Jokowi backed off, saying, well, okay, we better have a look. So we can see in many cases, when it comes to a, a real, to a crunch, he's not as decisive as we had hoped. <coughs> and so, uh, too early to say on the issue of the peat soils, the government's reviewing the decree and how it will be implemented. But um, when you have big political uh, and economic players lined up against you, uh, Jokowi, isn't uh, holding to his commitment so far. I think one of the, the shining lights in the, in the cabinet, uh, and probably one of the ministers with the highest profile, is the Minister for Marine Fisheries, Ibu uh, Susi Kuchi Stuti. And um, you've probably all seen the image of her standing there in a kabaya with the ocean in the background and a burning ship there, and her activity to, to uh, to destroy fishing vessels, larger fishing vessels, fishing in Indonesian waters without licenses. So that commitment uh, continues. Uh, she also said there will be a moratorium on any new licenses until the industry is brought under control. And of course, understandably and sensibly, her focus has been to target foreign fishing vessels. And fishing vessels, I think it was Vietnam, Philippines, Malaysia, and past Korea, was Thailand, that were just Thailand, that were destroyed. Now, at some point, one assumes she may get up enough uh, strength to take on illegal Indonesian fishing, but I think from outside, and fishing isn't my area, but it's been impressive to see a minister act decisively and say, enough's enough. Uh, I read somewhere saying, the loss to Indonesia from uh, illegal fishing from, from overseas vessels was in the range of $10 billion a year. So this is an enormous uh, economic impact. And of course, you can imagine that the, over, that the illegal fishing is associated with overfishing, with overexploitation, and damage. And so, having a strong minister taking an issue forward, which will have benefits for Indonesian fishing, uh, Indonesian economy, and the environment, is a very helpful sign. Um, so, just just to sum up. Um, Part of my work uh, is looking at the commitments that companies have made. And we've seen in the last couple of years very big commitments from <coughs> the largest pulp and paper and oil palm companies saying, pressured from their market, pressured from their customers and investors, saying, well, we won't take lands 
from communities anymore, or if we have, we'll negotiate in good faith and return lands or you know, compensate them. And saying we won't destroy forest values anymore. So I've been involved in monitoring those commitments, and unfortunately, they leave a lot to be desired. So perhaps, like my opening comments on Jacoby, we could say it's too early to say whether those private commit, you know, the publicly stated commitments by private entities are going to uh, be fulfilled and lead to better environmental and social practices. But I guess the hope is with the groups that I work with in Indonesia that between commitments that have been made uh, in the private sector and uh, sort of policy commitments made by Jokowi in his run-up to office and now in the early time, in the early months of his administration, we will see change in natural resource management and that this will have to include close cooperation between the work going on to fight corruption, the work going on to expose uh, human rights violations and uphold uh, good human rights standards, and, and the work uh, to support uh, a different kind of uh, natural resource management, one that's based around uh, respect for community rights, which the administration says it wishes to do. So although I would have to say that the early signs um, great. In fact, uh, on the issue of natural resource management issues, we haven't seen the government going backwards yet. We just haven't seen quite enough decisive action going forwards. Thank you very much. achievements, focusing on politics, and also the weaknesses of uh, Jokowi, um, one of which is constrained by PDP. And uh, the, second one, uh, the second topic, we'll talk about human rights, and um, Jokowi have made, have made few strikes so far, which is the uh, death penalty, and public outputs for all, and also uh, the military reforms. And the third one is the indigenous community rights and the environmental issue where the indigenous community rights is being addressed. Um, overall, uh, in the past five months, Jokowi has achieved um, some of his vision and vision, but there are still many issues that hasn't been addressed yet or um, resolved uneasily. So yeah, um, with this I open the discussion panel. Are there um, any questions? It's going to be divided into a um, few sessions and each session is um, for three questions on me. So, Christian Sikrianko from College of Asia and Pacific, Strategic and Defense Studies Center. I have uh, two questions for the first two speakers. Uh, first, I've, I've got the impression that Jokowi hasn't been up front uh, to push for uh, human rights uh, issues and defend human rights issues. Um, I just, I'm just wondering why and how influential are the, uh, Jokowi's advisors such as Ruhut Panjaitan and his colleagues um, in uh, making the government to be more reluctant in defending human rights cases. And uh, secondly, um, having a civilian government now uh, with Jokowi as a president, one would think that um, uh, the, the government would further professionalize the military, but as we can see that the army uh, recently said that it would be involved in uh, maintaining Indonesia's food resilience, even going as far as uh, yeah, helping the farmers to plant rice and, and cultivate the, the rice plantation. So um, uh, what's, what's wrong behind it? Why do we have, a, on one hand, a civilian government, but on the other hand, uh, the military is trying to reassert its uh, non-military uh, past, as it was under Suharto regime? Um, and third question is for the third speaker. Um, 
uh, what does Indonesia take to ratify the ASEAN Greece Treaty and why is it so difficult uh, to, to do it? Thank you. consider myself as uh, one of the strong supporter of uh, Jokowi during the campaign but uh, what has been happening in the last two months is quite disheartening and I uh, very uh, quickly uh, lost hope uh, although some still says like uh, I think all the speakers but I hope not because you are the speaker says that we still should uh, put our hope uh, that Jokowi is a slow starter as a Japanese uh, appointing company <laughs> and then but he will get like his way around uh, all the pressure all the political tension uh, I would like to uh, see that uh, 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 happening but looking at this way with the like the first uh, question uh, with the growing uh, influence of the military uh, under the Amizar Yakudu and then with the Kogi cabinet and then with this uh, 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 in subordinacy shows by the police yeah. I think police also now uh, has growing the momentum and support yeah, by all factions of the corruptors yeah. uh, and also with the Kogi's interest only on like specific sectors I, I, I couldn't see even in like Indonesia what would be like in the next six months, or uh, uh, let alone one year. I'm, I'm writing a report uh, that, uh, of a study that has been uh, undertaken last year, and the tone, everything is completely changed. Uh, uh, many uncertainties have grown uh, by the whole. Yeah, I don't know if you share that. Uh, <laughs> So uh, I think that's enough question for the first session, and I may give the floor to the speakers to answer the questions. Okay. Oh, thank you very much for your questions. I mean, uh, uh, for the first question for for Andy, I think. Uh, the positions of the president's advisor, especially you mentioned school budget, and it's right now it's very important since Jokowi even inaugurated and gave him power, and this actually seems uh, to make a balance with the vice president. As you know, Yusuf Kala is not your kids on the block of politics. And that is why, as I give you the example, how in the, in the different days, very next day, President's statements on embracing to resolve the current passport use is diff has a different statement by vice presidents. But this has an impact since you know in the in, in the presidential palace how there is a struggle of politics among the advisors. In January, especially in the issues of the uh, you know the the police versus KPK. This is actually why Jokowi needs to move to make uh, a good considerations or the best considerations. He moves uh, all the candidates to Bogor. Why? According to my friends, which is also uh, one of the advisors, mm -hmm. the situation in the palace actually is not clean because of the struggle between, it, it, they are actually Jokowi's men, but the problem is it's had, they have a different uh, interest. So he moves to Bobo. So can you specify what's their interest and who are they? I mean, uh, who are they? I, I cannot mention this. <laughs> who are they? Actually, you know. It's among advisors, okay? A lot of uh, news, new uh, media already discussed this, but this actually happened in, 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 in 
palace. How, you know, the, the situation is not really good for Joko. Even he felt that he cannot give the good decisions. So actually, one of the decisions is about that kind of issue. So he moves in Bogor. And we knew that after from Bogor, especially he can resolve and give the firewall back to TPR regarding the, you know, the appointment of the national police chief. This is not resolve of the conflict, but this is just like this since the conflict for a while. Now it's give the back the ball back to the parliament. So that's actually one of actually the his decisions in both. So in, regarding the Lord Banjait and others, that's actually part of the his politics, uh, political uh, considerations. And uh, regarding the military, actually we discussed this in Jakarta, how right now the army especially, it's becoming the, you know, is involving for cultivation rights, was <coughs> and this is actually the questions about how Jokowi's administration is building the professional mission of military. And it is true. I don't know why Jokowi is, uh, is understand his position and role, and the military itself, you know, themselves to understand the law number 34, 2004 regarding the TNI, where I'm also involved in this advocacy since the beginning. Now, there is a debate uh, on, not on the, so the, there is a debate among, among us, the, 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 the scholars who understand these issues. But as you know that the sound is not, you know, in, 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 in the inner circle of Joko, especially, especially in the army. And the commander in chief of the Diana, he just becoming a megalomania. So he just showing, for example, uh, you know, their force before the execution, which is very strange. How is this, this is actually very strange? How the TNI, you know, the military took the without any order by presidents, you know, deploying the troops in Nusa Kambangan Islands. This is actually wrong, and it should be presidents should give a comment, and mostly the parliament. But parliament is also silent. So this is not only emphasized on the president's side, on which is our professional decision, our military, but also the department. The department is silent. There is no comment, there is no critics from the parliament, especially part of the, you know, uh, uh, <coughs> monitoring this, on the military, regarding using the forces, you know, three branches of the armed forces, of the national defense, by guarding, you know, showing uh, to the world that uh, if, if any, any nations you know, can dare to, to attack us, we will, we will attack you back. But this is actually ridiculous. I should, I should say that this is ridiculous. Even in, and unfortunately, some of the uh, advice which is understandable, the, the role of the civilian government, they are not really, you know, play their roles. I mean, it's, it is very hard to, to say. Like, for example, everybody knows Andy Vijaya, but I think you know it. This is your teacher, right? <laughs> this is your teacher, right? Well, this is my friend. <laughs> so Andy Vijaya is one of the bright scholar in defense and strategic studies. He actually understand, fully understand about what is the military roles based on law. But what can I say? I said to him that, hey, do you understand that our non-commissioned village to become the advisors on how to cultivate the race, right? This is very ridiculous. You actually teach us, you actually share us how military should put aside from politics and other things, issues, including economics and everything. But probably you should, this is exactly in your position. I mean, that's, I, I really, I really have a pity to him. Because he never, he never speak about this to the president, I believe. Because he is actually one of the expert and scholars, I think one of the best that we have to understand this issue. And and unfortunately, I don't have the best answer regarding this. You know, the, the, how do we, how we should resolve these uh, situations? The only one I think uh, three weeks ago there is one article in Compass criticizing this. 
the only one. Two, three weeks ago before I leave to Sydney. And uh, actually, the article discussed how we have a back step regarding the, you know, controlling the military by involving in the, you know, which is not really part of the military role. So I agree with that. Uh, we have actually, we have, I admit that we have a very dis serious discussion on these issues, but we don't know why, you know, this, this kind of discussions have an impact to the administration in the recent situation. And for second questions regarding the the military growing difference. I do agree with you, Leo, but uh, as you know, one of the, our critics regarding the military is right now they have a special memorandum of understanding with any minister. It is actually dangerous because they are, they are actually trying to get more funds. As you know, one of the, one of the, one of the important things to control military is on budget, right? But right now they have a special MOU to any minister to get their budget. And actually my organizations a week ago already released a statement criticizing, not only criticizing the national legislation program on the issues of military law, on military bills, but also on this memorandum of understanding. Because this is a completely against the law, the TNI TNI law. Why? Because they are trying to make, to find another funds. Because in issues of business, I believe that Dana was to improve on the issues of uh, military business, which is already not really vanished, but they are, can control by himself. Not really civilian uh, administration understand the issues of military budget, but right now they are focusing for another, another funds. For example, the the, this example actually already practiced since long ago is the military comes to the village or here and then then you want to go some So this is actually a practice where the TNI, especially the army, looking for an extra budget from the local government budget. This is not free. There is no such a free lunch on this issue. It means that the local government have to pay any project led by the army, the local uh, territorial command. So this is, there is no sincere things regarding money. There is no issues on the family issue on the money. So that is true in Indonesia. And on this, in these issues in the military, yes, they got funds. They might get more funds, especially uh, from, from the battalion, from the local territorial command, uh, from the local, uh, local government. So I mean, I mean that we have a lot of work to do, especially you and uh, Ali, which is maybe uh, becoming an expert on this issue. Because I think we have the same interest in this issue. And fortunately, uh, this practice is still going. If actually start during SBY. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, if Leo consider Jokowi as uh, slow starter as in, uh, as in Japanese. Japanese. I hope that Jokowi is a slow starter as is a diesel machine. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> diesel machine. <laughs> diesel, oh, <right. laughs> diesel machine. Uh, but, uh, come on. Uh, I think we have to consider uh, 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 two things. The first, democracy is not a given, democracy is not a paradise where everything is solved. Democracy is an arena that uh, every people, every group can compete each other in a you know, peaceful way. You know, we can express our view, we can voice our disagreement with the government policy. So by kept Jokowi as president, we kept democracy in place. But keeping democracy in place, it means that we have to continue the struggle against inequality, against oligarchy, against the corruptors, against those uh, bad people that, that still dominate politics and economics. So 
Yes, uh, democracy is not the, 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 the final uh, destination. Even democracy is is a starting of the uh, uh, trouble and probably a long journey, the uneasy journey. But in and, 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 and democracy, our right to express outside, our right to voice outside is, is answered and guaranteed by by the, the rule of law. Although we have problems with the rule of law, but at least if we compare in the new order, you know, uh, it's much better. You know, uh, we can fight, we can organize, we can organize demonstration, we can organize uh, like music concert against Jokowi, we can pressure Jokowi. And the second one, second thing is uh, what we, what our uh, 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 perspective on, on, on Jokowi. I agree that Jokowi is a puppet of Mikawati or a puppet of political party. But I also agree that Jokowi can be our puppet. Jokowi has a successful puppet. Jokowi was uh, our successful puppet against all power that want to uh, uh, control Indonesia. Jokowi is our puppet against Prabowo. He has done his job successfully as our puppet. Now, as our puppet, we have to we have to fight with other master of Jokowi, let's say Megawati, or the, the Surya Palo, or Yusuf Kala. You know, Jokowi is not a puppet. But this is our chance. You know, this is our chance that as a master we can we can we can uh, direct Jokowi. But of course we have to realize that we are not the only one master. We have to compete with other master of Jokowi. So this is this is a challenge. Oh, how we compete? That's why we organize pressure, that's why we organize uh, 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 support uh, to, to Jokowi and, and, and many many things, you know, without without so far, so far, you know. Tempo still, you know, Tempo still uh, uh, freely writing and, and corporate um, critically you know, criticizing Jokowi. Uh, my organization still okay, you know, as a W, but still alive. No, no, no friends uh, 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 facing torture or kidnap or anything. You know. So far, it's okay. KPK, yes, KPK, it's a loss in the big Budikino uh, one but you know. One in four hundred cases, you know, the conviction rate KPK probably is still more than ninety ninety nine percent. So it it was a good achievement compared to <coughs> the anti corruption commission. You know. Like recently we had a discussion here how the the PNG anti corruption commission, you know, fight against the president and the the, the, the head of the second the head of anti corruption commission was uh, fired by the president. You know, uh, it, 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 it's much better than 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 other other other. But I, I say that this is not an a, a easy way. This is a, a, a will be a hard way to go to, yeah, to eradicate corruption, to, 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 to solve many problems in Indonesia. And, and, and like I, I mentioned in my presentation that eradicating corruption is not just implementing, you know, technical, sophisticated management a solution, you know, by improving e procurement, e government, that everything is okay. No, we have to fight this. Yeah. The Jokov, uh, the Ahok case is, is, is the example. How the implementation of e procurement and e budgeting should be accompanied with the direct fight against the parliament. Without the direct fight, there will be no <coughs> no reform. So the the the, the anti corruption campaign actually. Is to fight or to, to uphold the accountability, the accountability of the power, the accountability of those in, in, in the elite position. And of course, they will not happy with that. If it is possible, they want to uphold this KPK, they want to, you know, uh, 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 they, they want to loot the, the resources without any, any, any uh, obstruction from the people or, or from the anti corruption campaign or the criticism from the, from, from, from the media. But, uh, Yes, this is not an easy way. The easy way. This is our our journey to to have. So that's why. But probably because my 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 background is social activist. So that's why. Yes, this is our destiny to to to, to fight. You know. We lose 
in this in this in this battle, but we have to still continue our war against against corruption. Here, here. <laughs> <laughs> Before that, it's just only criticism in the media or, or protest, uh, sporadic protest. But once police impression with each other, then the movement became uh, bigger. And in and, and the, and the second of the, uh, the, the criminalization of KPK, I don't know about Sudan, we just had uh, one demonstration, and the SBY said that no, the opposition also should be uh, 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 prosecuted by the KPK. And it's finished uh, before the movement uh, bigger, uh, became uh, uh, bigger. But now I think yes, actually we must learn how to, to to deal with the situation. But you know, all the struggle need money. <laughs> so I'm sorry to say, but this is it is real strategy, you know. But I mean, it's, it's a very I mean those three are very powerful marches and of and yeah, 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 stay in prison so not that bad compared with the the uh, kidnapping or the yeah, killing. <laughs> Regarding the, how the struggle in the palace, you know that I mentioned one that like not only Lord but even Anu Jayanto. Anu Jayanto is a new kid on the block, so that is why even he mentioned something, you know, his you know his master is not really even they are, they are trying to you know, to kick out from the palace. He is actually one from the three who accused as the obstacles the relations between BDIP and the presidents. So his position is also in hot seats. How come he can say something? So this is actually my, my analysis regarding in relation with your questions. So as we know that right now PDF we act like not like a government party but act like an opposition. This is very ridiculous also. Okay. In in the case of KPK we knew how how even they informed they condemn KPK and also support uh, Budi Gunawan as a national chief of police and I cannot imagine this this part, a political party who's always said that he's uh, defending the small people, Wong Chili, party one Wong Chili. Can you imagine that? Right now, he, they are in the right side of the corruptors. Thank you. Thanks. Look, there was a question on the, on the ASEAN agreement on transboundary haze. So the Indonesian parliament ratified the agreement in September last year, uh, after 12 years. Finally, the last ASEAN country to, to ratify the agreement. And so there are big expectations that that may lead to something. But there are some problems. Um, in fact, the responsibility for Hay still falls to the provinces in Indonesia. Unless the national government declares uh, basically a national emergency and then says this is you know this is a national issue now so that means down at the provincial level and they're involved for closely with the companies and so on they're the ones who are supposed to be dealing with this issue in terms of uh, putting out fires and so on so structurally there's a problem in how Indonesia deals with the issue 